editorial consultant for the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. Um, I helped run a week-long teacher workshop that's winding up today, sponsored by the National Endowment for the University. So we have some teachers here from that. that touch on the incarceration. Three of them are Heart Mountain descendants. Um, Alden Hayashi is a descendant of incarcerees at Jerome. And it's a totally different and fascinating story, which we'll talk about. So uh, there's Dr. Susan Kamei, the University of Southern California, author of When Can I Go Back to America? As you can see, a very comprehensive history. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get teased a lot about how big this book is. Yeah. We should all be so lucky to have that much space in, in a book instead of hearing, make it shorter, make it short. We have Frank Abe, author, documentarian, author of this awesome graphic novel, We Hereby Refuse. Shirley Gucci, chair of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, author of Sets Ago Secret, which some of you have read because it's a required reading for our teacher workshops. <laughs> and it should be required reading for everybody because it's just a great story about Heart Mountain and the effect of the incarceration on so many different people. And finally, Alton Hayashi, author of this excellent novel, Two Nails, One Love. So we're going to start out with talking with each panelist about what inspired them to write their books. I'll go with Alden first, and we'll move the way down this way, and then we'll take it from there. Um, yeah, um, my book is about uh, my mother's experience. Uh, I'm Sansei. I was born and raised in Hawaii. And uh, not everybody knows that uh, there were a lot of Japanese Americans from Hawaii that were also incarcerated, uh, about a thousand sent mainly to the Jerome camp in Arkansas. Uh, and my mother and her family was, uh, was one of those. Um, and it, it wasn't just an incarceration. Uh, they were uprooted from Honolulu and, and sent to Arkansas. But during the war, in the middle of the war, in 1943, they were deported essentially to Japan uh, in a civilian prisoner exchange. Um, the US wanted to get back a lot of these US citizens who were, had been stuck in Japan, China, other parts of uh, Asia that, were, that was uh, occupied by Japan. So in exchange, uh, my mother's family got swept up in this. Even though my mother is, was a, a US citizen, she was born and raised in the territory of Hawaii. Uh, Lena, hi. hi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, but she and her family got swept up in this, so I felt I had to write about this. Uh, and I, I could kick myself, I procrastinated so long. I basically been an editor and writer about business, about science and technology. But after my mother passed away in uh, 2013, I, I said, I, I gotta get off my butt and I, I gotta do this book uh, and, and preserve her story. Well, um, I think what really started me on the journey of documenting uh, this family history was uh, after my mother uh, on her deathbed in, in 2005 said she wanted her code in or memorial money donated to Heart Mountain. And we were all stunned. We were like, Heart Mountain? What's that? And uh, growing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, being the only Japanese American girl that I was aware of, uh, most of my friends were black and white. And um, I didn't know much about the history. And so when my mother passed, I took her position on the board and I fulfilled her dream of building something at Heart Mountain. She was thinking like even maybe a memorial sign or a gift shop or something small. She would be totally flabbergasted mm -hmm. if she saw what we have accomplished today. Um, and then when I met all the characters in the book along the way, whether it was Norm and Al's relationship, the love relationship and marriage between Estelle Ishigo, a, a white woman and a Japanese man, and how their lives were destroyed by this process, and learning so much about the resistors and uh, those that fought bravely for our country, I really felt that the stories had to be documented since I was actually with many of those people um, at every pilgrimage every year. So that's really what, what inspired me along with many other reasons why I wrote the book. All right, Frank? 
Uh, we hereby refuse Japanese American resistance to wartime incarceration uh, is what I kind of boldly like to call the story of camp as you've never seen it before. And the reason is because in the last, you haven't really talked about this idea of resistance to the camps until the last 22 years in the Japanese American community. Until then, the narrative was dominated by kind of one or two terms. Uh, one a Japanese term, uh, shikata ganai, Japanese for it can't be helped, passive designation in the face of injustice. Or the Hawaiian pigeon term, go for broke, you've heard that. Uh, go, go all out, give 110%. Uh, patriotic self-sacrifice to prove that you're just as American as everyone else. Uh, those are, again, the two dominant narratives in our community. None of those really really rang true for me as a, as a kind of a child of the 60s, uh, born in 51. Uh, so uh, when I had the opportunity to learn about the Heart Mountain Fair Play Committee, uh, the largest organized resistance in the camps, uh, happened to be, it happened to be a draft resistance movement. Uh, I was compelled to do a film about it for PBS called Conscience of the Constitution. Uh, you can see it on Amazon Prime, 99 cents, uh, and it's been uh, a, a very successful film. Uh, <clears throat> the Wing Luke Museum, a couple years ago, got a grant from the National Park Service to do a series of three graphic novels. So they said, let's do one on these safe soldiers, let's do one on uh, white allies, those who helped us, and let's do a book about camp resistance. So, so I, uh, I got the commission to do this with two other uh, artists and another writer. And uh, we tell the story of uh, uh, three characters who are in their early 20s, who are, are not children in camp. They're, they're grown-ups, so they, they know what's going on. I mean, they, they're, they're not just hung up on the dust and the bad food and the weather. Uh, they're grown-ups in their early 20s who are asked to, to have things demanded of them by the US government. Uh, Jim Akutsu of Seattle refuses the draft at, Min at Minidoka. Hiroshi Kashiwagi uh, uh, refuses government pressure to sign the loyalty oath at Tule Lake, but later yields the family pressure to renounce his US citizenship. And then we cover Mitsuya Endo of uh, Sacramento, who refuses a chance to leave the camp at Topaz so that her case, a habeas corpus case, could reach the US Supreme Court. Uh, and her case eventually led to the closing of the camps. So those are the three stories we, we landed on for our, our graphic novel. And I'll talk more about the, the graphic novel part later. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Susan Kamei and my mother and her parents were in first in Santa Anita and then we're here at Heart Mountain. It's been a very moving experience for me to get to visit here for, for the first time and, and uh, be part of this community. Um, my dad's family were Orange County farmers, and they went directly to Poston. And uh, I think uh, my inspiration for this work really came about as a function of my father's involvement in the Japanese American community and leaders in JCL. And then my time in Washington, D.C., I'll say this for the benefit of the Manettas at Valley there, uh, from the time that I was at Georgetown, uh, 1978 to 81, was really uh, taken in by the Mineta family uh, and, uh, and, and the Washington, D.C. JCL community, and uh, was there at ground zero when the redress campaign really started to hit uh, the, the, uh, the, the hearings in the first of the Senate uh, and the start of what became three sessions of Congress. So I became uh, and remained active in the redress campaign. Um, through the um, th thought that we had fought the fight and, and uh, won the impo achieved the impossible dream when the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was signed uh, and helped and got to see my, my Issei grandmother that was alive still at that point, receive her check, and my, my parents and, and other relatives, <coughs> and really thought that um, our, our work was done um, mistakenly. And it was uh, in the clip that you might have seen in, uh, in uh, Kishibashi's film this morning of Carl Hippie on national TV using the uh, so-called internment camps as the justification for uh, a, a, a Trump proposal of a Muslim registry that um, my cell phone started to explode <laughs> with texts and, and emails from folks that I hadn't been in touch with in 30 years since, since the redress campaign had ended saying, we got to do something, what are you going to do? You know, what, I don't know, what are you going to do? I don't know, what, what are you going to do? 
Um, and everybody started <laughs> re-engaging and taking different kinds of, of, of action. And, and uh, it was really a few weeks after that in a chance conversation I had um, on campus uh, to create a class on the incarceration in our history department. Mm -hmm. uh, my background, I'm an attorney by, by background, and, and uh, some, a colleague in the history department said, oh, we, we, you know, we could use a, cl a class oriented to pre-law students and, mm -hmm. and uh, thought of my uh, redress work in terms of the legislative campaign. And I thought, no, this is my opportunity to do something about the constitutional issues and uh, created a class uh, that I uh, am, am still teaching. And uh, in the luxury of a 15-week semester, uh, was able to create what I thought was the, the trajectory to tell the, the, from the immigration uh, backdrop through not just about the incarceration experience, but through the, uh, through the uh, what we're also euphemistic kind resettlement and, and civil rights and redress and, and bringing it to the story of why it's relevant today. Uh, and so it was really the, the anti-inspiration of feeling the need uh, six years ago to, to do something and from the basis of constructing the course was probably about 75% of the ma material for the research for my book. I'd like to also point out this book here, Heart Mountain, The History of an American Concentration Camp, written by Doug Nelson, the Vice Chair of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, who was supposed to be on this panel before he fell sick this week. Mm -hmm. um, Heart Mountain is republishing this book. You can make an advance order. It should be out in about three months uh, in the reception room back in that hallway. Um, this is really where it started in terms of Heart Mountain scholarship. Um, this was the first book that was written about the camp. Doug came out here in 1968 as a grad student at the University of Wyoming, was directed by his advisor, Roger Daniels, who was one of the very influential scholars on the uh, Japanese American incarceration. This is his master's thesis that was updated and buffed up a little bit and then released in 1975. So we have gotten the, got the manuscript. We added a bunch more photographs. We have a foreword by Norm Mineta and Alan Simpson. We have a new afterword that talks about a lot of this history. So I wholeheartedly recommend this. I wish Doug was here to talk about it. It's a great honor for me to have worked on this book with him to help get it republished. Um, follow up on something you mentioned, Susan. This is your first time here. Mm -hmm. um, to the other panelists, Alden, when was the first time you have been to an, a, a former camp, or is this the first time? Uh, I went to Jerome, the, where my mother had been incarcerated. Uh, this, I think, uh, was before the pandemic, I think in three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, that was some. Uh, I knew it was going to be emotional, but it, I didn't expect it to be that overwhelming. Uh, and it, it really was a life-altering uh, event. Um, it, I, I was sad because I had wanted to go with my mother. I had really wanted, and I, I had asked her several times, and the last time she, she looked at me like I was crazy <laughs> and, and basically said, why in the world would I ever want to you know, take a step back in that state. Um, so, yeah, I knew I would have to do it by myself. Um, Shirley, how about you? What was the first time you were here? Well, unfortunately for me, the first time that I came to Heart Mountain was um, after, in 2005, after 2005, when my mother died of pancreatic cancer on her deathbed and she wanted her code in memorial money to go to Heart Mountain, and we were just totally stunned. And then we got this call from the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation saying they wanted to name the walking trail uh, in honor of my mother, and all of you can see it tomorrow if you're gonna go to the center, but it really talks about her, her life, and then there's a trail that you could participate in. And at first when I got the phone call, because when you don't know anything about something that your family experienced and your mother dies, you think that maybe they're calling you for, you know, oh. not appropriate reasons yeah. or whatever, wanting a donation or something. And I remember being pissed. I was like, I'm, I'm, like, I'm grieving. Why do they want me to come to Heart Mountain? 
So at first I said, you know, no, my brothers wouldn't go. And I mean, you wonder why, because my parents never talked about it. My dad couldn't go. He didn't want to go. So I was like left. And I just thought that if my mother would say on her deathbed that she wanted her code in to go to Heart Mounted, it must have been something to her, even though she never talked about it. So what I learned is just because somebody doesn't talk about an experience doesn't mean it's not important to them. It might mean that they're traumatized. So when I came to Heart Mountain for that dedication, Norm Mineta was there, Al Simpson was there, the governor of Wyoming was there, all these incarcerees that were incarcerated with my parents were there, as well as the Boy Scouts and everyone else. And I realized at that moment that that experience, this place at Heart Mountain is bigger than anything. And that's why I ended up joining the board. And the rest is history. Frank, how about you? Oh, in 1994, uh, Northwest College had a symposium on incarceration. I think the Heart Mountain Women Foundation was, was involved with that. And uh, we, we took the opportunity to bring Frank and me, all, all the guys who are still alive from the Fair Play Committee, Frank yeah. and me, Yostra, me, and Ms. Koshiyama, brought them out here. They were here already, so we interviewed him, them here, at, uh, got some location footage at Heart Mountain, and got Roger Daniels, who was speaking, uh, into a barrack and interviewed him inside the Heart Mountain barrack. Uh, uh, I, I, I know we were trying to get an interview with, with Yosh out in the middle of a field here at Heart Mountain, and clouds started coming and lightning was starting to strike. <laughs> and I was determined to get the shot, and my photographer says, we got to get out of here because our tripod is the tallest thing on the plane. Right? <laughs> 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 we got a lightning rod, and so we had a split. Uh, so that was my first time. All right. And Susan, how come you haven't been here before? Well, uh, I'm, well a little embarrassed to say I haven't been here before, but my mother didn't want to come. Mm -hmm. um, she and my father uh, got invited along with some very good friends who were from Hawaii, so they you know, didn't, didn't have any connection to Heart Mountain. Wanted them to come to a trip to Yellowstone. And my parents traveled with them before and, and said, sure, we'll go to Yellowstone with you. And while they were at Yellowstone, they said, oh, well, wasn't your camp you know, nearby? Let's go see. And of course, it was, this is before there was anything there. And um, so she went along pretty reluctantly, only because Everybody else, the, the other couple, um, and, and my dad said, to sure. And there were, but there was nothing there. Um, they took a picture um, in the road um, that my, my sister-in-law has. That's <laughs> I think. Um, but she would, she, she, she didn't ever really want. Once the pilgrimages started, there was some, something here, and I asked her about it, and you know, she just, you know, didn't, didn't want to. And then time, as as our children got older and we thought it would be a good idea, <laughs> David's back there thought he thought it was a good idea, and we just never quite got it together. And then the year that I thought I'd come um, was the year before COVID, and mm -hmm. yeah, just... Stuff happens. Stuff happens, yeah. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. We talked in the earlier session about uh, discoveries that people make, all the authors make as they're working on a book. Alden, you know, one of the interesting things in your book is the history of the mother character coming from Hawaii and ending up in Jerome in Arkansas. Why did they get sent from Hawaii? Because few Hawaiians were incarcerated. Why were they so unlucky to have uh, that happen to them? It was basically the leaders of the community. So it, it was the, the Buddhist Shinto priests, the Japanese language school teachers, the the Japanese uh, newspaper editors. Uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, was a somewhat wealthy businessman in Honolulu. And uh, he would entertain Japanese uh, dignitaries when they'd be in Honolulu. Uh, and so he was on the FBI list even before uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked. Um, basically, they wanted to cut off the head of the uh, community community um, because without all the, that leadership it uh, not that the community fell apart in Hawaii but it it, it lost a great deal that it, it never really recovered and um, fortunately we had the Nisei group come, who came back after the war Senator Danny no even to kind of fill that void but I always felt bad that the Issei that they sort of were robbed of that um, that role. Yeah. Did he recoup any of the things that he had lost when he was incarcerated? No. Yeah, nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, uh, they own property uh, near what is downtown Honolulu. 
uh, that, that's all gone. His business is gone. Um, everything. I mean, well, that's similar, surely, to your uh, father's family's experience. Um, talk a little bit about that and some of the discoveries you made while you were working on the book. Well, um, one of the most painful experiences of the Higuchi family was losing 14.25 acres, uh, now known as Silicon Valley today. Mm -hmm. And um, it was something that really affected my grandparents that they argued and discussed all the way up to their death. That's how terrible that experience was. Being on a farm, you're insulated. You could have like the Minettas, the next door neighbor took care of Norm Minettas. Um, uh, house, but that's because he was integrated more with the community, not living it on an insulated farm. So what happened is they ended up uh, having a forced distress sale, pennies to the dollar, um, which w what was really ironic about that, it was an Italian-American family that did that to my family. Instead of helping them, they screwed them, basically. And uh, many years later, um, uh, my father would drive around when he was there for business trips in San Jose trying to find the farm. So um, I think it was like when he was about 82, I was with my elderly uh, aunt, uh, who just recently passed away at age 99, and my other aunt, and we drove around the rain and we were finally able to discover that piece of property. And what was really irritating is the sign of the street was called Kersey Avenue. So they had so much money after getting my family's farm that they were able to have a street named after them. So that's why, why we were able to find the farm. Now it's worth, Ray and I did a valuation on the property, it's about 65 million. Yeah. So, but for that, I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> I wouldn't have had to work as hard. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, surely J J Jackie Barra says hello. He told me the story about the, the 14 acres. And he, he told me where the fort is located. Where's it located, the 14 acres? It's located, well, why don't you explain it? It's, it's near a big public hospital. That's near Valley Medical. Right. Yeah, right, yeah, right. that's going to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm from San Jose, too, so. Right, right. yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and some of that surrounding area has been subdivided. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's and all. each of those homes on a quarter acre lot is worth about a million and a half dollars. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, that's what happens in Silicon Valley with real estate. Um, Frank, what are some of the things that you discovered working on this book that stood out to you? Well, I'm, I was a filmmaker and a documentarian and a journalist. And so uh, the Wheeling Museum got our National Park Service grant to do a series of three graphic novels. Uh, the first would be Nisei Soldiers. Uh, the third would be uh, White Allies, those who helped us. Uh, and the second would be on Camp Resistance, the whole thing. So, you know, I submitted my, my answer to, I answered their press proposals. And uh, Tommy Konimura and I got hired as writers, and we had two artists who were hired as well. I've never written a graphic novel. I, 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 wasn't, I had no, no, uh, uh, I, you know, no, no plan for that. So I had to learn how to write a graphic novel. And uh, I, the, my discovery was, you know, naturally, uh, I went to Art Spiegelman and Mouse, uh, the story of the uh, Holocaust. I mean, that, that's the gold standard for graphic, historical graphic novel. And if I could have made you know, the Japanese, the mice, and the, uh, the white guards, the cats, as, as uh, Spiegelman did, I would have I done that. Uh, but instead, no, we, we, uh, we spent two years learning how to, how to really, uh, you know, create a dramatic story, uh, but, at the, but at the same time being um, authentic to the characters. I mean, it was important thing was not to make makeup characters and, you know, uh, put our own words into their mouths, but to draw as much from their own speech and syntax as possible uh, using their own words. And fortunately, I, I knew Jim Akutsu in Seattle. He is the model for John Okada's, the protagonist of John Okada's novel, No No Boy. I, a not very famous novel I encourage you to read about post-war Seattle, the return of a drafted sister from McNeil Island. Um, Hiroshi Kashiwagi I knew very well from San Francisco. He's very public as a playwright and a poet and an actor, so uh, we have bodies of interviews with these guys. And again, I knew them personally, so I knew how they walked and talked. We wanted to do a story of the Supreme, one of the Supreme Court cases. And you know, everyone knows Gordon Hirobayashi, Min Yasui, Kuramatsu, because they have children who have created foundations around them or done films about them, and so the stories are well known. Mitsuya Endo, the fourth Supreme Court test case, uh, her, she never gave interviews after the war, very private person, 
and her children did not, I mean, her children didn't even know about her kids until they were you know, in high school or college. So um, that was the challenge, was to, to look, there. She, she gave no, there are no recorded interviews of Mitsuya Endo that survive. And there are only two oral history interviews, one of them by John Takeishi in his fine collection, uh, and Justice for All. And so the challenge was to create a character based, you know, with very little personal knowledge of her. Fortunately, she had letters that she wrote to her attorney that we could use. And uh, uh, again, these oral history interviews where you could get just enough of her syntax and her thinking and her language uh, that we could kind of build a character around her that's authentic. And I, and I capped it off. I, I wanted to know what her nickname would be, Mitsuya Endo. And as we all know, Nisei all have colorful nicknames like uh, Bacon or Horse. You know, <laughs> or and, and so I, I had an idea that her, what her Mitsuya would be, would be anglicized to. I, I went to uh, talk to her son in Chicago and, and uh, get his, you know, kind of get his blessing for the project, get his permission to you know, tell his mother's story. And, and that was you know, ris risky because you know, I didn't know Wayne, Wayne didn't know me, and you know, I, I didn't want him to think we were trying to you know, exploit his mother's story or you know, do something wrong with it. So we did her, and, and I asked uh, finally, you know, you know Wayne, uh, did, your, did your friends ever call your mother, what would they call her in you know, conversation? Did she have a nickname? He goes, oh yeah, 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 uh, Mitzi. They called her Mitzi. And boom, uh, that was it. They, they, she, they call her, uh, uh, like after, after the actress, Mitzi Gaynor. Uh, and and I, I had an idea that was her nickname, Mitzi, but I, I, I needed to confirm it so that we weren't, again, making stuff up uh, and putting words in their mouth. So I thought, you know, with the confidence of that, we were able to kind of go ahead and, and really tell the story, build a character. And, and I, I think that uh, her children are pretty happy with the, with the outcome. Susan, you mentioned earlier that you found a lot of things in the war relocation authority files of your family members and other people. Along with that, was there anything that, that you kind of like stumbled across in a weird place or an unexpected place that led you into down that like a different path or interesting path for your book? Uh, so uh, I had an amazing experience getting to uh, the War Relocation Authority files on my parents and, and my grandparents and, and many of my aunts and uncles. And you know, every document was, was a surprise, uh, both in terms of uh, just, the, uh, just, the, just the obsessiveness of, of the government to have kept records on the incarcerees. Uh, there were these uh, psychological assessments of, of the students that I'm sure they had no idea were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were making on them. There were uh, in pencil uh, on that you know, kindergarten paper, uh, their uh, Americanization essays uh, that, that they were required to, to write. There were the medical records, um, mm -hmm. and uh, had no idea that my grandparents' health was was so poor. Um, and my dad had a tonsillectomy in 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 in, in Poston. Um, so uh, every every you know every page <laughs> that I turned turned over in a file was 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 itself a a shock and a, and a, and a revelation. Um, but the one thing that I um, uh, realized in looking at my father's father's file, my, my paternal grandfather's file, was about this thick of telegrams and correspondence between various offices um, in Poston, in Orange County, with social work that they were trying to, to go back to um, uh, under the, the, the releases between uh, Washington, D.C., various uh, officials in the Department of the Interior, and it was this bureaucratic um, pass the buck. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it was this, you know, all this correspondence that was going back and forth that said, well, tell the Kameis that they need to file this form. And, and, and then tell them to come back. And they go, okay, the Kameis have filed this form, and we're following up to see whether, uh, that, whether that's been approved. Well, then there'd be a telegram that says, we're, we're very busy, and uh, we, 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 we can't find the file. So tell them to come back and file the form again. Or um, uh, you know, uh, telegrams and letters that would go back and forth with the social worker in, um, in Orange County saying, uh, uh, you know, the Kameis have now uh, arrived here. There's, it's a large family. Um, there's, there's seven of them. 
they have no place to stay, they're living in their old trailer, her host trailer that um, had been broken into and there was nothing left and you know they have nothing and when, when were they going to approve their, um, you know, it was like $14 or something like that, the resettlement, the resettlement um, subsidy. And it was, uh, you know, uh, we have no record of that, tell the committees to put that, and just went on and on and on and on. And I had seen a reference, uh, but had not seen any primary documentation of a policy of the government not being able to legally prevent the West Coast incarcerees to return once the exclusion orders had been lifted. Um, but I've seen a reference that surmised that there was this policy or this practice of the government just mm -hmm. stalling and, and, and trying to do what they could to discourage them mm -hmm. from, from coming back to the West Coast. And when I saw you know, this, this file that was this thick um, with you know, just this response time and time again of, of well, you know, we don't have any information or tell them to come back or, or no, it's been denied and they have to appeal. Then I said, okay, I guess this is my primary, primary source, and you know, and I included that in the book. Mm. The details in that are so, all those files, such granular details that are really helpful with when you're fleshing out a huge story like that with intimate personal details. So I think what was useful for me was at the time that I saw the files, I had some context for knowing what kind of documents I was looking at. And so, um, and, and, and in a way, in a weird way, that was that was exciting, <laughs> you know, to be able to see see. Okay, this is what this permit was. I, oh, this is that travel document. Right, Shirley, that's part of your experience too, where you found things in the files of some of the key characters in your book. What were some of the things that really stood out to you? Well, I, I, I mentioned this in the earlier session um, about how um, my mother's experience of having her appendix out and having to walk from um, her barrack, I don't know, a mile or so to the hospital chimney boiler room area. So you'll see that tomorrow when you guys go to the museum. Um, but also the fact that, you know, she ended up getting like a D in physical education because she missed 14 days of school while she was in that makeshift hospital. There was another thing that I saw that I mentioned in the last session where my father, who was just a young kid at the time, I don't think he was probably at that point, see, 11, 12, 13, but he was probably like 15 or so. He was trying to leave, or 14, he was trying to leave the camp early to go live with his older brother in Wisconsin. And so they were doing these intakes to see if the, 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 the kid is qualified to leave the camp. And the one point that the guy made was, Bill is a, an unusually good-looking boy. Like, what does that have to do with being qualified to leave the camp? And just sort of these level of inappropriateness, like Susan had mentioned, you know, evaluating and, and um, segregating children. They're already being segregated from their communities by being put in a prison. But they were actually labeling one kid as an A student, you're, this one's a BC. And I remember interviewing uh, Judge Raymond Uno um, and uh, Dr. Jeanette Masaka in Salt Lake. And um, that, that being identified as a B student traumatized them for their entire life. I mean, you, you know, basically you're not as smart as these A's. And both of my parents did, did get the A student. So it was just those little things that just seem incredibly shocking. Um, and in my mother's file, um, I kind of got the feeling that they, some of the teachers might have resented her a little bit. Uh, my mother was unusually poised. Her photograph is in the museum. And almost as if they were kind of indicating that she was like a little snotty, you know, and, and kind of felt she was superior because of, um, maybe because she was coming from a city. But they also uh, gave her an, an American name. And in that corner, they wrote Shirley as her American given name, because she was Satsuko, and the book's name is Satsuko Secret. And that was a name that she kept for a while, but she ended up giving to me, which I mentioned earlier, I don't like the name Shirley. I mean, I use it because it's my given name, but who names her kid Shirley? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like to have this feeling, you know, historically, that I might have been named by a camp prison guard, <laughs> uh, because that was the name they wanted my mom to have, kind of makes me feel a little weird. Best. Alden, what did you find in your family's files that stood out to you? Uh, 
one thing that really stood out to me was uh, the absence of information in my grandfather's, my mother's father's file. Uh, but there was the transcript of his initial interrogation uh, after Pearl Harbor. Uh, and it's a chilling read because they had an FBI agent testify first that my grandfather had claimed um, a year earlier that if there was a war, Japan would win the war. But there was no context to when this was said or who said it. Could have been in a bar, who knows? It could have been a jealous business rival. Who? None of that. And, and the FBI agent wasn't question about where he got that information. So that fellow leaves, and then my grandfather comes in to be interrogated. And they ask him, uh, did you ever say that Japan would win the, and my grandfather said no. And I could just kind of feel the wheels turning in, in the, the interrogator's minds that, oh, he's lying, you know, and this is proof of his guilt. Whereas, you know, it, in a more kind of a legitimate interrogation, you say, well, so-and-so said that you said this a year ago. So at least my grandfather would have had the opportunity to say, no, I never said that. And that guy is, uh, you know, he hates me or whatever. Or, you know, it, uh, it happened in a bar. We were drunk and we were just, so none of that context was provided. And I just it kind of squirmed the first time I read that interrogation because I, I just, felt like the, the die had been cast and my grandfather was trying to trying to save himself, you know, saying, you know, that he went to the Makiki Christian Church, you know, which actually I didn't know uh, until I read the interrogation, uh, you know, trying to say he was Christian and, and, and all these kind of ways that he was squirming to try to save himself. And, and I just don't know that the die had been cast. And, so five years ago when Shirley was researching and working on her book, some people said, you know, there's really not much of a market for books about the Japanese-American incarceration, but here we have four authors of books about the incarceration. Um, so well, why do you think there are so many books now about mm. this part of history? Uh, well, let me t tell you a little uh, backstory on Simon and Schuster and the opportunity to to tell the story uh, through the through uh, a publisher of the of the of the reach of Simon and Schuster, that their concept for this it's, it's published by the Simon and Schuster's uh, uh, books for young readers, so the young adult imprint and the educational imprint. And when I first saw their proposal for for the book as a concept. It was what I call Encyclopedia Britannica level. It was it was Pearl Harbor's bombed. There's this thing called camps. People went into it. Camps closed. End of story. Um, and so I was asked to give a technical review of, of what they had outlined in this. And I, there there were some there were some you know pretty uh, outstanding egregious uh, errors that I gave them documentation to to correct. But generally, I said to them, I said, well, I don't think you were asking for my opinion about this, but this is the opinion I'm going to give you, which is, you know, thank you for being a major publisher and wanting to, to do a book on this topic, but this is the wrong book. You know, you're, you're buying into the government mythology um, that Pearl Harbor was, was the cause of this and that uh, at the end of the war, everybody went back to some kind of happy life and uh, gave them you know, some, some context for why I said the book that should be done is this book, but at that point they just said, well, thank you very much, and we'll, you know, we'll get back to you later, and you know, they went away for, for uh, several months. Um, and when they came back to me and said, well, for lots of reasons we, we thought this, um, I said, well, but again, the book that should be done and the book that I would be interested in doing is the book that tells a full story, and that um, in the process of of uh, putting the material together for my course, there's a lot of very fine scholarship but on particular aspects, whether it's the Nisei soldiers or the, the constitutionality of the Supreme Court cases or, or the, you know, the, the pre-war immigration experience, but there's these slices, and that's the way academic presses work. And there wasn't anything that pulled the whole story together, 
and took advantage of uh, really a wealth of information that's been out there, but disembodied from the historical context in the uh, video testimonies uh, from the commission hearings um, and, the, and the written and the written testimonies, uh, the very fine work that Densho and the Japanese American National Museum have done and the UC Veterans Organizations have done in capturing um, video oral histories uh, along the way. Uh, and having that information out there but not um, threaded with, with the, the story and being able to tell the incarceration experience from um, a first person perspective um, and to show, and I think this has been a, a, an important part of the, the variety of books that are out there, that there was no monolithic experience, uh, that there are many, 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 many variations uh, uh, many different aspects. I mean, our, our, our stories here, you know, very, uh, very different um, reactions. And that out of the 120, I think Duncan thinks the number is closer to 125,000 that came under the War Relocation Authority jurisdiction, that, that there were 125,000 different stories. And, and, and parts of the stories. Uh, so it's just logarithmic in terms of the stories that, that could and should be told. And so um, I think it's um, oh, the rising tide floats all boats. That um, the motivation, uh, I mean, I think we're a really great <laughs> set of examples of different kinds of motivations for telling different aspects of the story. And that we're able to reach different kinds of audiences this way. Uh, Naomi Hirahara, uh, that came out with uh, Clark and Division, that she's known uh, for uh, being a mystery writer. And she's written this, you know, really fantastic historical, but it's really a, it's a history. And you're 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 reading about the Japanese American history without even realizing that you're while well, you're you know being taken along on this on this on this mystery novel. Mm -hmm. um, and so she and I have actually been on a panel where we talk about you know I'm talking about nonfiction, but in a storytelling way. <laughs> and she's written uh, a crime novel. Uh, and telling you about history, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so different audiences are going to connect with uh, different kinds of publications. Um, and so um, I think that whatever whatever our, our respective motivations have been, um, we're all you know that we're all part of the same cause mm -hmm. in bringing to light for different kinds of uh, segments of the readership out there an awareness that they might not otherwise have had. Frank, what do you think is, there's all these books out there, what do you think is the book that hasn't been written and should, needs to be written? Is there a story that you know of that needs to be told more? Yeah, the one I'm doing now. <laughs> uh, and there, needs, there needs to be an anthology of the literature of incarceration, a work that collects the writings from the Issei Nisei and, and then the, the post-war, the Sansei Yonsei, uh, dealing with uh, the legacy of camp and collecting them with an introductions that kind of weave it all together and, and show how these literature, short stories, poems, talk about, and essays are all addressing one thing, and that is the nature of the government in causing all this to happen. I was using obscenity, but I mean, it's causing all this to happen so that every piece is, is selected to point directly at you know, the accountability of the government. Whether, and, 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 and translating new uh, Issei writings to varied in Japanese language for his years, uh, and, and as well as uh, Nisei letters, journals, and manifestos, and then Yonsei, uh, you know, kind of, uh, the, the new Yonsei poets are looking back, mm -hmm. trying, to re yeah. trying to reconnect with their, now their grandfather's, you know, story. The grandfather's a big thing right now. So uh, this would be uh, the, the uh, Penguin Classic will publish this in 2024. The, the Penguin Book of the Literature of Japanese American Incarceration. That book is good. All right. All right. Get on it. <laughs> All right. I'll give my advance order for yes, you. Oh, and we recently, in uh, the school district in Wisconsin, the decision was made to not purchase and distribute the uh, novel When the Emperor Was Divine by Julia Atsuka, because somehow it didn't tell a balanced story of the incarceration. Um, What's your feeling about that? And do you think that that is something that we're going to see more of in the future? Uh, unfortunately, it, it didn't surprise me. Um, I, uh, 
wrote a Facebook post, I think about two, three years ago, about, about my mother and the, uh, including the, the Statue of Liberty story, how she was, uh, got emotional when, when she saw it again. Um, and it went viral. It, uh, it, in 40, 50,000 shares, and, and it got shared in the most unusual places. Uh, the Oklahoma Republican Party or something had shared it, and, and so I got all these comments there, and um, it, it was de depressing, but um, that, that we're still kind of fighting the same battle, that uh, people cannot separate Japan and the Japanese and Japan from us, we're Americans who are of Japanese ancestry, and, and so why should, you know, what Japan does, what, why do we have to de defend that? I don't, yeah, um, I, I was at a, recently at a conference at uh, MIT about immigration, and, and this is at MIT, uh, and, and one of the questions was, well, you know, why, why should the U.S. take in more people when, look at Japan, Japan doesn't take in, you know, its, its share of, of immigrants, and I thought, what? Why are you bringing up Japan? And we, like we're talking about U.S. and what is right in the, the I mean, it, it's mind-boggling uh, and sad that um, we're still fighting this these battles. So, so no, it, it doesn't surprise me. I I don't know the answer to the second part of your question whether it will get worse. Um, I hope not, but I I don't know. Mm -hmm. Shirley Hartman had an interesting reaction to that uh, Wisconsin decision. Can you tell us a little bit about that and why you thought it was so important? Well, we did. We what we did and what we do do, and um, is that when uh, people either appear ignorant or they're making a decision not to provide information to their students, we invite them to come to our museum and learn firsthand in terms of what we know about the incarceration experience. Uh, typically, they don't take our invitation like Wisconsin <laughs> didn't. We did invite Donald Trump, um, and, and he, he didn't take us up on our, our invitation as well. That was about like five years ago or so. But, um, you know, I think it's important that we continue to educate, and I think the uh, teacher workshops that we've been conducting here, not only this past week, but also the week before, we trained up close to 70 teachers, right? And what you do is you train those teachers, and we bring teachers in from all over the country. So if every teacher learns about our experiences here at Heart Mountain, just imagine how many kids they can reach. It's, it's so on and so forth, you know, thousands and thousands of kids. So my whole view on what's happening in our country today, I think Manetta Simpson Institute will help having a forum where you see a Republican and Democrat working together. But I really do see this as a chipping away at a belief, a chipping away at parts of America that we need to chip away to educate them, to make the full integration and, and to get our country on track with what accurate history is all about. Right. I believe that invitation to Donald Trump came after that mm -hmm. clip that was in the movie the we saw, movie. Carl Higbee saying there was a precedent for a camp that, you know, they cited Korematsu as a precedent. Shirley did an op-ed in USA Today that said the president, or president-elect at the time, needs to come to visit a, a camp and come to Heart Mountain. Um, he didn't come. But Liz Cheney will be here tomorrow, so that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Frank, when, when you were working on all, all of your body mm, work, mm. is there any one book that stood out to you as an influence for you as a journalist and an author? John O'Connor's No-No Boy. Mm -hmm. uh, Seattle man, uh, uh, went to Puyallup, Minidoka for three weeks, uh, then Nebraska Junior College, enlisted in the MIS, served in Guam, flew in the belly of the B-24, uh, mm -hmm. intercepting Japanese radio signals, comes back to Seattle, meets his friend Jim Akutsu, uh, who was a draft resistor. And, he, and being in Guam, he heard nothing about what was happening with the loyalty questionnaire, the no-nos at Tule Lake, and the draft resistance at, Minidoka, at, at Heart Mountain in Minidoka. And it is kind of, uh, this is the story I want to write. This is, and so uh, John Okada takes notes from Jim Akutsu. They have drinks at the Wame Club. Uh, Jim, uh, Okada goes to Detroit for 10 years, works at the Detroit Public Library, and uh, writes his great American novel. He had the idea to write the great American novel. And he published it in 1957, 
couldn't find a US publisher, had to go to Japan. A guy named Charles Tuttle uh, published his book, uh, best book, The Best of the East, and Best Books for the Best of the East, Best of the West, something like that. And uh, uh, comes out, edition, edition of 3000, uh, doesn't sell for anything uh, in the US, and uh, is forgotten until in San Francisco, 1971, or 75, I should say, uh, the Combined Asian American Resources Project discovers it, republishes it, and it becomes the foundational work for Asian American studies in the 70s. Well, Susan, how about you? Oh, gosh. Um, I'd say that the body of work that um, I drew a lot from, it, it was really inspirational for me with, with the testimonies that were submitted um, by the incarcerates with the commission hearings. Um, the uh, ones that were uh, submitted either in, in written form um, and or the, the oral testimonies uh, that, that were transcribed. Um, and then in, Cal in, in Los Angeles and then, and then later also in Chicago where they rediscovered tapes, we also have the, the videos. And so this was a major breakthrough for the community um, in terms of, you know, for, for those of, I, that was the first time I'd heard my fa some of my father's stories. Um, and then um, because they've been, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Jack's uh, f funding and, and, and other, you know, NEH and other, other funding along the way, those videos that were done in the 1980s with volunteers on Betamax, and they've been, they've been remastered until now they're um, on DVD and, and digitally available. And I played uh, my father's, the, the clip of my father's testimony uh, a few Christmases ago, you know, before COVID, to my uh, daughter and uh, other mm -hmm. grandchildren that had assembled. And my dad had been passed away at this point. And uh, it, it, I, I took pictures to, to send to the NCR folks who were behind uh, the funding for this and said, said, you know, the, the, my, my dad's grandchildren, um, it, just, uh, it was just uh, so, moving and, and, and impressionable to them um, to be, be able to see their grandfather at a much younger stage of his life and to hear him tell his stories. Um, and uh, so I think uh, whether it's being able to see those videos of, of the ones, especially from LA, um, and to uh, have the, the capture of the stories of, of, the, of so many of the survivors yeah, in the 1980s, um, is, is, is just a, a precious uh, community com you know, uh, asset uh, and, uh, and, and especially with the impact that um, those of us that were family had not heard those stories before. Alden, how about you? What book is, was an inspiration for you? Uh, there's, so, there's so many. Uh, there, certainly no more boy. But I, I go back a little further uh, to a short story collection that not a lot of people don't know about, uh, Toshio Mori's uh, Yokohama, California. And that, um, to me, uh, it's an essay writing um, about the, I think, the Oakland area, the East Bay area. Um, it, when I read it, although my Nisei parents were born and raised in, in Hawaii, I still felt that he was saying things that my parents probably felt and went through, but couldn't articulate to me. Uh, and I, I just love that book. Um, I hope it's reissued. I hope so. Yes, University of, Washington, University of Washington Press has a nice edition with Lost Minada's New Forward. Oh, oh, excellent. Yeah. All right, Shirley, how about you? Well, um, growing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, not being exposed to a lot of Japanese Americans, I was very, very insulated. And um, so any reading material in my home was actually brought in by my parents. So I don't want to take any responsibility for what I read. Uh, but I, I was, uh, I, uh, I read Bill Hosokawa's book, uh, Nisei the Quiet American. I read it several times. It had great photographs. And I thought it was a great book, and I learned a lot from that book. But then many years later, when I was writing my book, I noticed that he left out the resistor. <laughs> and some of the history yep. was very much um, sanitized, mm -hmm. I guess. And so um, to be quite frank, you know, unfortunately for me, um, I think I was a little brainwashed as a kid. And a lot of my discoveries about Takashi Hosozaki, who's still on my board, 87 years old, uh, Frank knows him very well. I learned much about the resistor 
teachers when I joined the board and um, after my mother died in 2005. And getting to know Tech uh, firsthand and interviewing him and getting to know him and, and be his friend was the best learning experience that I had. And um, I'll tell you, when I first met him, because I was brainwashed, I was like, oh, resistors, you know. And I think, I think one time I used the word troublemaker, no, but not, you know, no, you know, which is a derogatory term. But I said, no, we can't do that. Those guys are troublemakers. And then I realized, in retrospect, that term is derogatory. And I think what was really nice about uh, my relationship with Takashi today is that we're very close. We um, respect each other greatly. And you know when somebody like Takashi says, Shirley, you're doing a good job, you know you are. And that, that's been one of the best compliments I've ever received. Yeah, it was striking um, the absence of that whole resistor story in He Say the Quiet American. I mean, particularly since the author of the book was here when it was happening, or had left just shortly before it happened. Um, it was just, and then there were some discoveries about Bill Hosekow in the course of writing Setsuko's Secret. Tell, talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, I don't really like to play the blame game on everyone. I think that when you start sort of calling out other Japanese Americans, it's, it's kind of a crazy situation considering that we're all like victims here, right? And we don't know what people do when they're under stress or what motivates people to do certain things. But I think the reason why he was at Heart Mountain, um, it appeared that it, it was probably that he was picked by the government to come to Heart Mountain and run the newspaper, the Heart Mountain Sentinel. Is, and as we all know, that basically the newspapers that were in the camp were basically propaganda material, right? I mean, that's what they really were. So I learned a lot about that um, uh, researching the book, and, and by the time the book was finished, I had a very different view of Bill Hosokawa than I did when I met him when my mother had died in 2005, and I came here for a memorial dedication for her. And he was here actually with Normanetta, L. Simpson, the governor, et cetera. So the, it, to really be able to know these characters and meet them when they were sort of distant figures is, has been a real remarkable experience for me. Okay, well I'd like to open it up for questions from uh, the audience, if anybody has any. Yes, sir? Hi, um, you had mentioned the uh, Wisconsin Board of Education book, um, or when the emperor was divine and the ban of it, but my wife, um, was, who, who, whose parents were in Amache, her reaction surprised me when she said that uh, the, uh, she was almost encouraged by the number of people from a very local, that was a very local conservative community in northern Wisconsin, mm -hmm. wherever they were, mm -hmm. and you know, Trump territory, basically. Mm -hmm. And there were 14, 1,500 parents who signed a petition against the board's decision, mm -hmm. against this guy's decision. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that changed anyone's opinion, you know, if that, in your analysis and the things you saw on your viral tweet, and on your viral Facebook page, in all the comments that you see, if that fact encouraged you rather than... Oh, oh certainly, certainly, yeah. yeah. Um, it's hard to say. I. I don't feel like I really know our country as well as I, I thought I did. Yeah. Uh, I Certainly over the past uh, six years, certainly during the, the Trump administration, uh, the fact that there are people still denying that President Biden won, I, mean, right. I, I, I can't wrap my head around that. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, a lot of things surprise me now. Yeah, yeah. It's, just a, it's just a thought. I thought yeah. that occurred, and I, I know her reaction, so I was wondering if yeah. any of you had the same reaction. One of the parents reached out to Heart Mountain after that happened to see if we could contribute to whatever they were doing. So I thought that really? was encouraging, yeah. Um, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think, you know, there are tremendous resources, um, archival materials, documenting Japanese American history, pre, post, war. Um, but I, it's been interesting, you know, in sort of knowing some of Alden, how you approach your writing, and um, Frank Abbe, and sort of hearing you describe um, Mitsue Endo as a character, right? There's all that we can know, but then there's a tremendous amount that we can't know. Um, 
about, you know, even our own parents or grandparents. And so I'm wondering if you can maybe talk about sort of how you reconcile, sort of like what is archivally available information, but then how did you maybe fill in um, some of that stuff that you, you know, how your mom was feeling or you yeah. know, why maybe you consider this sort of fictional or fictionalized memoir um, and sort of how as writers you sort of grappled with that gap between archival fact and mm -hmm. sort of the stories you're telling. Could I? That's not all the time. Yeah, <laughs> I, um, I discussed it in, in the previous sec section. In, I wanted to tell my mother's story as nonfiction. I, I, I'm a nonfiction writer. All, all my career I've, I've written about science, business, technology as a journalist, and, and I've only written nonfiction. Uh, but in trying to write about my mother's story, I, I came up with what I call the, the triple level of deception. The, the first level was the government's level, deception about the camps and about the, the reasons why they supposedly were, were necessary and, and all kinds of things, why they repatriated my mother to Japan when she had never been to Japan. Uh, so there was that level. The second level I kind of knew I was going to run into, which is my mother's, I, I don't want to say lies, it's a strong word, I would say white lies to me and my brothers. In essence, she wanted to protect us from the truth. And she didn't want us, my brothers and me, to grow up to be bitter or angry about this. And as she did tell me at one point, you know, this is my past. You know, and you have your lives, and that part. Okay, I, I expected I was going to run into the third level. I I was not prepared for, and that level was that I learned that her parents had lied to her or told her white lies about what had happened because they had wanted to protect her, and consequently, my mother actually ended up believing a lot of that um, or not realizing that that was what they had done. Mm -hmm. So in trying to write about her and what happened, it, it was trying to figure out, it, it, it kind of negotiate, navigate through these three levels of deception. It, it was difficult. Uh, things that happened did happen. They, they were sent to Arkansas. I'm 100% sure of that. I, I have all the documentation. I know they were deported. I know where they lived after, all of that. But like you said, how my grandmother felt when this happened, or, or how my grandfather ended up making the decision he did, like what factors influenced him, all that. I don't know. I just can give my best guess, which is why in the end I decided to write it as fiction. Um, yeah. We had a question over there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, kind of on that note, how do you think Yonsei and Gosei, who have less access to first-hand accounts of incarceration, can contribute to this conversation and preserve the legacy of uh, survivors of uh, J incarceration? Well, that's not, tr that's not true. Your premise, <coughs> I challenge the premise of your question, <coughs> because the Yonsei have just as much access to first-hand uh, information as anyone. Now, you, I, I, you're probably talking about personal Family. Connection, perhaps, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but, but no, I mean, the, 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 there is a lot of material left by, uh, you know, by, by, the, by those families. I mean, whether it's uh, in the government files that were kept on them or just re researching the given circumstances of their movements. If you, if you just look at the movements, if you, if you, there are plenty of records you can find that we use, to, you know, that I use to, to document, for example, Mitsuya Endo's story. I never met her. I don't. I, don't <clears throat> I have no family stories passed down to me about Mitsu Endo, but I, I can I can reconstruct her life. I did a biography a biography of John Okada, <clears throat> and I, I reconstructed his life just based on dates of you know dates of, of, of where they were at the time when they left. You know, and we, the, with the camp the, with the, his years in camp, those are all documented by WRA files. Uh, you know, when he went to Nebraska, I can get school records over there. And so on. You get, you get the point. Is that you just get get the primary documents, research the period, research the the circumstances that they were in, uh, what kind of car do they drive, you know, what what the how much that car cost, um, and then you you can you can build from that an, a fairly uh, accurate uh, history of any particular person. It, it's it's what it's what journalists do, and 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 uh, whatever then whatever family legends or stories or myths are passed down. 
that can help you know inform your story like I did with Alden. You know, help help you know, drive the narrative or the the character's deepest desires or wishes, and uh, you you can use that to help you know direct you or guide you. But but there, there's there, you you can ground it in in reality by by just doing some 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 good research. Could I, could I take another stab at it? Because yeah. I saw Anne joined us here, and that's uh, for instance at the Japanese American National Museum. I think with the kind of technology uh, with augmented reality um, to be able to construct the um, the um, with video uh, some some of the sur surviving incarcerees to be able to um, bring them to life and keep them alive for us uh, to be able to experience uh, the kind of uh, uh, discussion uh, as if you were able to interview them you know your, yourself um, and the kind of uh, I mentioned the uh, archival information that's been out there for you know 30 years through through Densho and the museum and and others it, it's just that you have to dig you know to, to Frank's yeah. point about about being a journalist and being a researcher um, to, to piece this t t together, but but actually, you know, for for Alden and Shirley and myself as Sansei, we that's what we've had to do. Go get your family's war relocation files in Washington D.C., mm -hmm. and then after that, any living relative mm -hmm. um, that may have knowledge of those people, you have to interview them. The problem is that the government's plan worked for me. It fractured our Higuchi and Saito families, so we're scattered throughout the United States. So for me to go interview my relatives now in San Jose when I live in Washington, D.C. is a hardship, but I went ahead and did that anyways. And you're going to have to ask them really tough questions because a lot of these children want to keep their parents' secrets. So if your mother didn't tell you stuff and her mother told her lies, you really have to almost become an interrogator sometimes to get the truth. Luckily, my oldest uh, uh, uncle, James, who was actually a medical doctor in the Army when my family was placed in Heart Mountain, did have a journal. And he kept really uh, uh, good information. But then it required me to go talk to his little sister and ask tough questions. Like, why was this issue in existence? Why was there this problem? I even interviewed my brothers about their perspective on my mother and why she was so controlling, which was a byproduct product of her incarceration. So you kind of try and Yeah, you really that. need to be an investigator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you got to remember that, you know, I don't know in your own families, but most families that have experienced this, they're reluctant to talk about it, even if they weren't there. Mm -hmm. And it makes them feel weird, but you just got to, you just got to press them. You and know? also characters are similar. If your grandfather was a, was a farmer in Salinas, I mean, there are certain things that are that are going to be characteristic of that of that that place, the weather, the situation, the pro the, the crop, what crops they grew, you know, that kind of thing. You can still go to those characters who are similar to your grandfather in Salinas and find old history interviews at Den Show that can you know open up a window into what kind of challenges he faced as a farmer, for example. Anyone else? Oh, okay then. Well, oh, there's a question here. Raise your hand. Okay. Sure, sure. Um, I just wondered. You talked about interviewing your brother, and um, you know, way what you wrote is 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 a is a narrative that you're putting forth for your family, and for all of you, you're putting forth a narrative for Japanese Americans. And the, um, I just wondered, how do you grapple with that? And I mean this in the most sincere way, not in a, any you know talk about appropriation or anything, but just how do you handle that kind of burden of trying to speak for a larger group? And how do you decide what to put in the book and what you keep back and things like that? I just spoke my truth. I mean, it's my life too, right? And, and these are this is my family members, and I'll, I'll be quite frank with you. Some of the stuff that was in the book, some relatives didn't feel very comfortable with it because I didn't make them look good enough. Or I didn't make their father look good enough, or I didn't make their uncle good luck, but I just told the truth. I mean, uh, so um, I just think, you know, you're very young, at least from what I could tell. And I think when you get older and you experience life and you look back, you, you have regrets that you didn't do things differently. And the way I didn't talk to my grandparents that much or spend time with family members in the way, but it wasn't my fault. And we all know we're talking, it wasn't my fault because the, the information was withheld from me. It's not my fault that my relatives got scattered throughout the United States. And it's not my fault that I felt that in many ways my parents could have done things differently. But I can't 
judge them for the way they did that. So I think it's really coming, becoming comfortable with, with what you feel that you need to say and go with it. And I know a lot of young people don't feel comfortable writing about that, but what I tell them is keep a journal and write down an interview and talk to your family members and whoever you can. You don't need to do anything with it now, but videotape and collect the information so when you need it 10 years from now, it'll be there. If, if I could add a little, um, I, I think of the, the Nikkei experience as this huge tapestry. Uh, as Susan talked about, with so many voices and all that. And for me, I found it paralyzing at times to think that what I would write needed to represent the community or this or that. And and I, I it's, um, talk about writer's block, you know. And how I got out of it, I told myself, no, I, I can't be responsible for the, the whole tapestry or, or even a, a swath of that. But I can be responsible for my piece in that tapestry. So like Shirley was saying, you know, her truth and the way she, so that I can write about. And that is, I, I think, what you should write about and, and not be paralyzed by thinking that you have to represent more than, than you need to. Um, and that's yeah. how Japanese Americans were taught not to talk about yourself. So it's hard, mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. hard if that's what your messaging has been your whole life. All right, well, that's our last question. I want to thank everybody for coming to see us. Thank you.